Okay, and a very good afternoon. It's a nagging problem that many countries are facing. Our children are sadly dropping out of STEM as they grow older each year, despite employers calling out for these skills. Countless reports have been written lamenting the issues, but why is it happening? And what are we doing about it? And why haven't things changed yet, despite all of our best efforts? Now, before I introduce my panel of experts that we have here, I would like to ask you, the audience, two questions. Please raise your hand. Do you have children? Many of you have. I'm not going to ask you how many. Have you got a STEM background? Have you taken STEM subjects at high school in year 11 and 12? Or have you studied STEM at university? Quite many. Can I now ask you a third question? How many of are your children participating actively in STEM at school or at university? A few. So even you, the converted, struggle to get the message through. All right. So I would like to introduce our panel. And uh, please welcome them. We have here Sebastian Choi um, from uh, Cube Rider on my left. Bob Williamson, the chief scientist of Data61 on my right. Catherine Mackey from the Queensland Academy of Science, Maths and Technology, Brisbane. Ruby and Ryder Horowitz from Emmanuel School and successful participants in the Young ICT Explorers. We have, well, well done, yes. We have uh, Callum Predevet, a year nine student and from uh, Mossman High School and the Hills Young Innovator of the Year, 2015. We have uh, Kate Burley, the CEO of Intel Australia. And we have Lauren Johnson from Canberra Girls Grammar School. All right, please welcome the panel. Okay. So we want to explore this nagging question together. And let me start by asking Laura. Laura, your, your student, you have chosen not to take STEM subjects at school. Can you tell us about your experience? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a bit different in that I didn't choose any STEM subjects whatsoever. I've gone completely humanities. Um, and I've done this for two different reasons. Not because I was pressured into doing humanities, because I'm a girl but because, first off, there's an opportunity cost when it comes to choosing a STEM subject for a lot of people out there. For a lot of people, choosing a subject like maths or like science, it takes a lot of extra time, yeah, it takes a lot of, sorry, it takes a lot of extra time to study hard enough in order to be good at that subject. And so for me, in order to be good at maths or science, I had to do a lot of extra study, whereas for humanities, it just came more naturally. And so in order to get the best ATAR I could, it was then a smarter idea for me to choose humanity-based subjects. And then we've also got um, the second reason, and that's that I just really like humanities-based subjects um, compared to maths or science. So there we go, that's my story. Okay, so Lauren, you're saying you think you get, get, up, get better grades at school by not doing STEM. Is that yes. right? Yes, yeah. And that's, that's one of the two drivers. So you like humanities, you think you get better grades without STEM. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I also like science and I also like maths and I also like all those other STEM subjects. But I'm better at humanities. Okay, so you're making the smart, informed, intellectual move by not taking STEM. Because you don't want to ruin your ATAR. Uh, yeah, it's all to do with my ATAR. Yeah. Okay, so interesting. So you are now in, in year 12, right? Yes. So let's, let's hear from Kate Birdie. Uh, Kate, you have, what's your background? How did you become CEO of Intel Australia, a tech company? Um, well, I've worked for Intel for 17 years, so it's fair to say I've worked my way um, up the ladder in Intel, and on the way I've learnt um, plenty about microprocessors and the importance of STEM. But um, I myself was a humanities student as well, um, and so I'm asked to speak a lot on this topic, of course, because companies like Intel and myself personally, I actually believe we, we obviously have a crisis in in terms of not enough students um, adopting STEM-based subjects, um, but I'm an example of do what I say, not what I do necessarily. Uh, because I was a humanities student, I only did maths because it was compulsory back in the 80s. Um, and I came into Intel with the communications and then went on to do a, a business degree. So I've got a business, an MBA background. So that's my story, but definitely working for one of the biggest high-tech companies in the world. 
Okay, so you're saying the, the, the background, with you, the business background, doing an MBA was even as, as important, if not more important for you in your career being successful in a tech company. For the type of job that I do, um, you know, an MBA is fine, but if there are certain elements of Intel that there's no way in hell they would employ me. So, and that's a good thing because, um, you know, they're engineering and science driven. So there's room for both, all subjects. But I do agree with our panelists here. I have two daughters of my own, um, and one of them's a great humanities student. The other one is more maths and science focused. And I've heard a very similar argument from my year 11 daughter, um, which is it's just not practical if she's playing for the best score in the ATAR, it's not practical okay. for her to choose that. So it's a, you know, the ATAR is not helping our um, challenge at the moment around getting more students uptaking STEM. Okay, so it looks like we've identified one of the culprits, whether it's the ATAR or the OPs, it's called in Queensland. So Kathy, let me ask you, you're the deputy principal of uh, Academy of Science, Maths and Technology. So all your students are in STEM topics. Can you talk about those students? Why do they choose? Your academy. Thanks very much, Carsten. I'm privileged to be a deputy principal of one of the three academies which offer the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. And while we have three campuses that focus, one on science, maths and technology, the other on creative industries and the other on health sciences as selective entry schools, which is an interesting concept in itself about how these disciplines actually work together. For us, we're actually much more interested in, in the whole discussions around STEM and STEAM and um, as a pedagogical issue or the way that we teach and learn as opposed to, you know, and it saddens me a little bit, but it's a reality that, ki that our young people are definitely very, very concerned about what subjects they will teach in order to um, achieve the best ATAR score, which then takes up that pathway to university. And one of the things that we're really working on is with our staff and our students is actually cycles of inquiry around innovation thinking and what are and bringing in the idea of history and business and economics so things like what are the preconditions for innovation and invention then these may be proactive or reactive how do we recognize problems and draw new connections and opportunities what constitutes the inventive process and the design thinking cycle and particularly how we disseminate these how we analyze success and competition um, in the business sector how do we reflect upon those consequences and affect real change in communities and also not be afraid to actually reap the rewards of intellectual risk taking? So these are things we work on with our teachers rather than necessarily be overly concerned, although you know, obviously we accept that students will make choices based on their career. Okay, so um, let's hear from two students who have uh, successfully participated in the Young ICT Explorers, right? Um, uh, Ruby and Ryder, tell us about your projects. What have you worked on and, and what, what did you like about it? Um, well, the first thing um, I've ever done with coding was I made a website and it, I went to a holiday camp for coding and they taught us how to make a website and some other coding languages. And um, I was the youngest in the group, but I really enjoyed it. And I carried on. My project for the Young ICT Explorers was I made a virtual friend app. And it was where you could have a conversation to your virtual friend and according to your age um, and your interests, it would shape your virtual friend and their responses to you and how they would talk to you. Mm, fantastic. And, and Ryder, do you want to tell us about your project? Um, for the Young ICT Explorers, my project, my project was with a robot that was going around the a board and that was simulated as a hospital, and it went and stopped at all the cabinets where the sick people were. To, um, so like those trucks that go around to give the food. And so that's what I did for mine. Um, I started doing coding when I was in year one, and 
I first started doing like block coding and then, yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you took it from there so well and so you've built a robot and your sister has built a, a virtual friend app, right? Can I ask you like, um, uh, Ruby, uh, your friends at school, what do they say about your work? Do they, do they understand what you're doing? Well, out of the girls, um, there's one other girl in my year who um, I convinced to try coding and she joined in um, coding lessons with me and really enjoyed it. Um, some other girls, like maybe three other girls in um, 80 students in our, in our year um, do coding, like a little bit of coding or have a little bit of an interest in it. And some of the boys in our year also have an interest in it. Most of the people who don't do coding, uh, I'll say generally out of the girls, um, probably wouldn't do it because only two of the girls do coding and they might think that if none of my other friends do it, why should I do it? I might not have a good time. But you just need to experience it to make your final judgment whether you like it or not. Okay, so they put it sometimes in the too hard basket, you're saying? Pardon? Do they sometimes put it into the too hard basket? Um, some... They say it's too hard? Oh, well, most people just haven't done it before, so they don't know what to do and okay. they might think that it's too hard or it's only for these specific people. Okay. And, and Ryder, what do your friends say? Well, my friends always say that um, only the brainy kids do coding and uh -huh. that they can't do it, but they actually haven't really tried. So I always went at school at a coding um, club and we some and we that last year we went to Nikta, uh -huh. just around the corner actually, um, for a competition and um, I came first in the year three and fours. Uh -huh. So then this year it sort of encouraged a lot of kids. So because last year there were only like eight, six to eight kids doing it, but now um, this year. Um, they had to decline so many kids because they were pe the pe the amount of kids that wanted to join were sixty to seventy kids. Wow, <laughs> that's fantastic. That's really good to hear. Okay, so it's it's more interesting now for other children as well to participate. Um, can I look to my left here, Sebastian? If uh, if you don't mind, um, you're doing uh, with CubeRider. You're trying to make STEM more interesting. Can yeah. Can you talk so, about that? Um, what CubeRider does is we make it really easy for school students to send code into outer space. We basically let school students send their own experiments to the International Space Station. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of schools currently participating in the program, and our first launch will be taking place this year. So you're sending experiments up to the International Space Station? and then let students observe the experiment, or can they actively in interact with the experiment? So what happens is we've developed uh, what, what's called a payload, essentially, and it's got a whole bunch of electronic sensors aboard it and a whole bunch of different things that students can monitor, and they can code in a language called Python using really, really simple electronics called the Raspberry Pi. And what happens is they control that, and they control the sensors and the types of data they get to actually disprove or prove hypotheses. And it's all about sort of making STEM much more fun and much more realistic. Instead of learning about space science or instead of just you know, looking at a Bunsen burner and having a teacher talk at you saying, this is a scientific principle, you're out there in outer space literally observing it. And would this attract only the quote unquote brainy children, as we've heard from Ryder, or Not all at sorts all. of kids? So with that, um, what we've done is we've actually made a program that really appeals to a whole bunch of different students. We're not just teaching them about space science, we're teaching them about STEM, design thinking, critical thinking, and those are the actual really key important aspects for students to actually start understanding what STEM is really about. It's not so much learning how to code, even though that's an important part of what we teach, but it's also about 
a whole gamut of other sort of STEM activities. And so students will actually be more enticed to do different things depending on their inclination. Um, so some of them might be really into sort of designing the experiment, and some of them might be really interested in actually coding the experiment, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah. All right, that sounds interesting. I, would, I wish I had had that at school. Me too. Uh, Callum, can I ask you, Callum, you're, you're um, actively engaged in the scene, you've got your own startup, you've participated in Young IST Explorers, Young Hills Innovator. I mean, d d if you don't mind me asking, why do you do STEM? It might ruin your ATAR in the long term. Um, I generally am very interested in like, STEM subjects and do quite well in subjects such as like maths and software design. So I do partially I do that because I think I'll get a good ATAR out of it, and partially because I just love it. OK. And what, what about your peers at school? Do they love it as well? Do they, do, they, do they follow your example, or what do they do? Some of my peers like, also love science, technology, and maths. And they sort of follow my example. And others, they aren't really very interested in it, regrettably. OK, is there someone like at school you collaborate with? Or are you doing this all alone by yourself? There's a coding club at school, and there's a group of people who are just very interested in these sorts of things. And I sometimes work with them on different sorts of projects. OK, oh, interesting. All right. Can I ask, uh, on my right here, Bob Williamson, our chief scientist at uh, Data61. Uh, Bob, you have got a, a long-standing career, very successful career in STEM. Um, can you talk about this? What, what drove you to become part of this STEM area to study science, technology, engineering, math? And, and then what has been your experience in working in this industry for quite some time? Um, sure. So when I was a kid, almost as young as these guys, I was interested in radios. Um, computers weren't such a big deal then, and I had a ham radio station. And it was a cool thing to be able to talk around the world. You know, to do that on the telephone would cost you a fortune, and that's why I did it. And I did it because it was fun. I thought it was cool and that's what I wanted to do. And I actually feel incredibly unsophisticated and almost out of a job when I listen to these students who are going to take over my job real soon because they're far more strategic about what I was doing. It truly was. I just thought this was really cool that you could pluck a signal out of the air coming all the way from the other side of the world with a power less than one of these light bulbs. And then I could then talk back to that person. So I just continued doing that stuff. So Radios are signal and noise, and so you could say poetically, all life is signal and noise, and that's what I do now. I do machine learning, which is extracting signals out of patterns of data in everything. So you've made your curiosity, you've turned it into a career. That's right. And you found someone to pay for it. That's the way to do it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, but what would you say, like with the STEM discussion that we've had now for, and I looked up the history books, I mean, the STEM discussion seems to have started as a result of the Sputnik shock when the Soviets launched their first satellite and then the Western world woke up and said, well, that's really bad because if they can put a satellite on the top of a rocket, they could put a nuclear warhead as well. Um, let's not forget that was the time of the Cold War. So that's when it started. And would you say from, from then until today, despite the importance that we all put as a, as a collective on, on science, technology, engineering, math, still the students seem to be doing something else. We followed, uh, we heard about you could ruin your ATAR as one thing that, that we, the adults, have put up a system that implicitly discourages the students sure. to go down the STEM path. Having been in this industry for some time, what is your observation? What, what other things have you observed by maybe students even at university decide, no, look, I, I tried STEM, I'm not going to do it yeah. anymore. So, so look, the fear of doing it and like the investment in time, this is something that you certainly hear. I think the fear of failure in doing it, I mean, this is a crucial thing in everything. Like, you know, am I going to be able to be good enough? But it occurred to me in listening to what the students here were saying that perhaps part of our problem is just thinking in terms of these rigid categories, right? You know, you are either doing the maths and science stream or you're not. Now, it's a completely false dichotomy. And what you're seeing now in, you know, uh, leading universities is a breaking down of that, right? So we do not need all of our students to do umpteen courses on this stuff. If a lot of them do a little bit, that's already enormously valuable. You don't have to do it all in school. 
if you didn't do it in school, it doesn't matter. You can pick it up later on. My daughter, um, like many uh, teenagers, had some maths anxiety. Oh, I can't do maths. I tried it. It didn't work. I can't do it, right? She's got over that now. She's doing night classes to catch up on her maths, right? So, you know, the decisions that you, the idea that you have to make a decision when you're a teenager, when the world is a confusing place, and then that locks you in for the rest of your life, that's a frightening one. But it, I don't think it is that, I don't think that is the case. And what we need to do as educators is to provide those opportunities for people to come in at it from umpteen different ways. Mm -hmm. There, there was, uh, thanks Bob, there was a recent study by um, the OECD based on the PISA, PISA, PISA data for the last 10 years and they spoke specifically about confidence, the fear of participating, the fear of failing and you were talking about breaking down some of these barriers. I'm just wondering, uh, maybe here asking, asking Kathy, is at, at the academy how do you break down the fears? Do your students, because they are STEM students, do they have that fear? Um, no, I don't think so. And a lot of that is about actually creating a, an environment of like-mindedness. And we're very fortunate in a selective entry environment that we can do that. But one of the really interesting things about working with teenagers is, and as um, we've, we've also alluded to the idea of imagination and collaboration and teamwork, and I was talking to Laura earlier about her university aspirations, but if you pair Laura with somebody like Sebastian, well, what are the outcomes going to be? So rather than, I think, often seeing each other, seeing our strengths as in one area or another, we need to see our strengths and perhaps the areas where we can develop as part of, obviously, the greater team unit. So that if we put people together that have different um, strengths, and particularly in the area of communication and dissemination and sharing, and, and we see a lot about you know, um, science communication and science journalism, and we've just experienced the World Science Festival in Brisbane that's come out of New York and will be in Australia for the next six years, where the, I guess the, the communication aspects of STEM and STEAM and, and all of these other associated disciplines are driving that further. And I think one of the other things that we also fall into the trap of a lot is education is about life and not necessarily about your career or your university pathway. And I know in the conversation about ATARs and OP scores and IB scores, etc., that we tend to get caught up in that and sometimes lose the, I guess, the value of the imagination and curiosity and innovation and problem seeking and creation of problems as a, li as a life skill as we were discussing rather than necessarily a path into a degree into university. Okay, thank you. So we heard about breaking down barriers, we've heard about the ATAR scores, now we, how we adults have put a system in place that is actually not, not helping. <laughs> um, also suggestions in, in, in how engagement could be improved, how confidence could be built. But if I now look at maybe Laura and Kate, um, I don't know who wants to take that question, is like when you hear these, these good suggestions, how do they resonate with you? What do you think about them? Okay, so. I completely agree in that um, I, I think that if we were to collaborate and if we were to view it instead as um, not just being good at one particular aspect, um, that things would definitely pick up and that um, a lot of students would benefit from that. But I do see that there is another problem which we haven't really touched on, which is barring people from choosing STEM subjects. And, um, that problem is that a lot of people, and Sebastian did cover this a little bit, um, is that a lot of students don't see the practical applications for continuing maths or continuing science through their senior years. So I know that a lot of my friends in year 11 and 12 have decided that they know all the maths that they're going to need throughout the rest of their life, so what's the point in continuing, continuing it in year 11 and 12? So I think that one of the ways that we could combat this was to show that it still has real-world applications and that we can definitely use these skills later on in life. Well said. Um, I would also just add to that, you know, we've heard from some of the students here today and it feels that, and one thing that Intel knows in the, the work that we do with schools in Australia um, and around the world is that hands-on learning is what seems to inspire students to stick with STEM because through the, whether it's space club or coding club or science club, that's where you do the interesting stuff, right? That's where we start to discover how you can apply these critical skills to potentially solve some of the big problems of the world. 
The thing that fascinates me is why is that interesting teaching happening in the clubs and not in the classroom? So we seem to have this dichotomy of sticking with a very rigid curriculum in the classroom and doing all the cool stuff in the club. So if you never get to the club, chances are you may be turned off from choosing STEM. If I take some of the other, uh, other subjects, the argument that I'm giving a lot is they're more interesting, we do more fun stuff at school, it's more inspiring. And yet we know, everyone in this room, I mean, you're an easy sell on how interesting and inspiring a career in STEM can be. But for some reason, we don't seem to be able to teach it in a fascinating way within the structured classroom environment. So my big call to action is, to everyone in this room, is let's work and support our educators on how they can make STEM more interesting to the students in the everyday classroom and not just reserve the fun stuff for the clubs. All right, so Kate, you were talking about, Kate and Laurie, you were talking about the practical applications, we were talking about the hands-on learning, and, and, and you were talking, Kate, about this disconnect between the great examples that exist in the world, and, 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 and Bob, for example, you would know many of them, and, and the teachers not having access to these examples. So are we talking about like a mentorship program between ICT professionals and, um, and teachers, for example? Could this be one way of how we convey that information to the teachers? Um, I think there's two things. I mean, definitely mentorship with teachers, also retraining of teachers, because not, you know, if I look at some of the schools that do exceptionally well in the STEM areas, it usually centres around one or two brilliant teachers that were in that school. And, you know, not every school has those brilliant teachers. So how do we raise the bar and support all of our teachers to get to the level that we need them to be at? I'm not a big one for bashing the teachers. I don't believe in it. I think it's all of our problem and we all need to work on how we help those teachers succeed around these subjects. And let's take the good role models that are out there already, embrace them, celebrate them and get them to teach the other teachers how to make it more interesting. The other thing is for industry, companies like Intel, we spend a lot of time, not just in Australia, but around the world, um, going into the schools and bringing some of our projects to life, um, enabling hand, hands-on learning, trying to paint that picture of what a career in STEM could be like. Not, not a career heading up Intel as an MBA student, but a career where you're actually solving problems um, within industry, you know, with microprocessor technology, for example, we spend a lot of time in that internal mentoring, really trying to be part of the solution. And we also spend a lot of time with other companies. And we heard from Boeing this morning, like a great example of a company doing great work as well. We, we all need to solve this problem, so the onus is then on us not to sit in judgment, but also to be part of the solution. If I could just add to that as well, um, with regards to teachers, it's actually, from what we've seen, you know, it's actually quite difficult for them to sort of teach these creative things. Um, with the CubeWriter Create for Space program that we're trying to roll out to schools, for instance, it's incredibly difficult for teachers to actually have such an engaging sort of course inside their curriculum because they have to teach certain key learning outcomes. And sometimes those interesting things, even though they're fascinating and students love them, literally can't be taught because a teacher has to cover this topic this day. And that's a really, really big thing that we need to address as a nation with regards to sort of the structure of our education system. And that's something that I think isn't at the moment. All right. Bob has got a comment on this? Yeah, so I, was, I wanted to pick up on this, the national curriculum. So it's introduced for a laudable reason, right? You know, we want to lift the country's game. We want to make sure how we're doing. And the trouble is it's this kind of perverse cycle that occurs in education that you end up worrying about measuring what you're doing rather than doing it. It's as simple as that, right? So if you obsess about the measurement rather than the doing, you lose space for that creativity. I had the fortune to sit next to um, a, a science teacher who'd won one of the Academy of Sciences Best Science Teacher of the Year awards. And I asked her, what is the fundamental problem that you've got? And she said, it's the national curriculum, right? Now, I don't want to attack it, but I am, I realize. Um, but her point was that it didn't give her the freedom to do the cool stuff she wanted to do. She knew what to do. She could do it, but she felt constrained. So we just have to lift those constraints off her, forget about the league table so much, and just get on with it. Just, just doing rather than measuring. To, yeah, less measuring, more less, doing. Less measuring. Yeah. All right. Um, 
Kathy? Can I just um, follow on from that? There is some great work being done in pre-service teacher education, particularly in the primary area. And I think one, there's a couple of critical issues. One is the support that those of us in the secondary sector can give to our primary colleagues uh, in providing the air, some you know, specialist resources and specialist knowledge to be able to support that. Because uh, in order to support our really young people like Ryder here, we need to have specialist expertise down in the primary system. And there's been quite a lot of gradual changes occurring in pre-service education in the primary space to ensure that those um, teachers do have prerequisite degrees in STEM, as well as obviously the appropriate teaching and pedagogical um, expertise. The other thing that is also really important is the importance of industry and the cultural and scientific sector, such as the museum sectors and those, um, and you know, the full range of partnerships that are available to provide real world peer mentors at all stages. So particularly for girls, so that we see, we introduce our young girls like Ruby to people who are working, you know, 17, 18 year old, very early stage career researchers at the very, very earliest points of their university degrees and to understand the, the importance of research beyond the university sector and into the industry and cultural and scientific partner sector is really important. So that girls can start to think about STEM careers in a much more broad way rather than what they would see as a stereotypical way. Okay, thank you for that. We still have five minutes, so I would like to open up this conversation with questions from the audience. We've got a microphone here somewhere. Does anyone have got any questions to the panel? Raise your hand, please. Yes, one question here. <laughs> it's not working. Me off. It's working. Already. Um, I won't make a joke about that. Um, so my question is, I've got two daughters, and um, one of them just finished her HSC last year. Um, they both were pretty good at math, um, could have easily done extension math, and she dropped math completely. And it's not because it's hard work. She did four major works last year, which uh, in anybody's book is a lot, um, and worked extremely hard to get her, her HSC. My second daughter's in year 11, She's dropped down her math. She hasn't dropped it completely. The observation I've made on both of them is, and this is just for girls, I think more than um, for boys, it's, there's a certain amount of um, competitiveness in the way math in particular is taught. And there's a certain age, say between 13 and 16, that girls go through in particular, where they're not where they won't even put their hands up necessarily as much. And so they're not invited into that whole thing. So it's about how quickly can you do it? There's math sums sent out and kids have to do it, you know, beyond a certain time and they put their hand up when it's done. There's a lot of, you know, competitive sort of stuff that's done in the classroom, which I think turn girls off and they feel inadequate and, and scared. Is that something that's shared, is that something that's um, common, is that something that's being addressed, or is that sort of just all in my head? Okay, so what is your question? You're saying the... Comp so it's saying this way that math is taught and some of the other STEM subjects, there's a sort of competitiveness and an and if we took the competitive exclusivity part, to it too. in the attitude of the teaching okay. that I think turns not just girls off, some boys as well. All right, so can I ask the panel, who wants to take this question about the competitive in teaching maths in school? Bob. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not in your head. It's absolutely true. It's a problem and we need to fix it. There's no question about that. And it's not just true in mathematics, it's particularly prevalent in computer science, um, you know, our main business here. And um, the irony is that that single, you know, focus on yourself competitive uh, trickery that you need to do doesn't deliver the goods when you go out and work, right? That is that is the irony of, of it. So universities are aware of it. It is a hard thing to change. Um, so I'm not going to give you the magic solution, but I'll acknowledge the problem. Um, I'm very fortunate that I work in an international baccalaureate uh, diploma program environment 
And I don't know whether other people have some of that background, but one of the fantastic things about that particular curriculum framework is that all subjects are created equally, if you like, in terms of value at that scoring point of tertiary entrance, which is a point of difference. And the other thing is that um, within those courses themselves, students, there is not a finite number of students who are competing for the top score within the rank within the group. So there are some things about the IB that are fundamentally different. And, and again, we keep harking back to sort of the university pathway model. But one of the other really powerful things about this particular um, curriculum framework is that all subjects, all students, regardless of their subjects, choose a subject called theory of knowledge, which is a critical thinking study of epistemology and knowing how to know, which ties in all of the subjects that students do together. So subjects are not um, studied in a silo fashion, but the teachers in the IB have to work as a team to teach the whole student through the sum total of their subjects rather than going from maths to science to history to economics and, you know, in junctures of 70 minutes away. You know, I think a lot of our schools now are going through a phase where the traditional model of schooling is quite an industrial model, you know, classrooms, groups. A lot of us have done a lot, of, you know, made huge leaps in the last 20 years in terms of more collaborative learning. But in terms of managing timetables, you know, I think we've got a long way to go. So I can only speak for my own environment. I'm not in a position to uh, make a comment about any, you know, the New South Wales or Victorian system. But the international baccalaureate model does probably have some learnings that we can all, we can all consider and reflect on. Okay. Thank you. And Laura here had a, an answer. Yeah, um, it's not just STEM subjects. It is the schooling system as a whole. And we've seen that it's actually created this massive, um, more prevalent mental health issue across students, across Australia, not just across Australia, but actually across the world. So the, the whole system is completely competitive. Uh, it's not just some sub subjects, and it definitely needs to be combated because at the moment, as things are going, it's, it's not okay, and too many students are suffering. Okay, can I ask our other students here, maybe, Callum, what do you think about the competitiveness of teaching in the classroom? What is your experience? Around every test time, everything always gets really competitive. You've got students like comparing their answers, how well they're doing th in things. But outside of tests, it doesn't really feel very competitive as such. Okay, and, and Ruby and Ryder, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I know that um, in high school, it's a bit different to primary school, and one of the subjects that aren't graded is science, and a lot of people in our year haven't really done lots of science, and then there are the people, there are like a few people in the year that we know are much better at science than other people, so, or in maths, for example, the people who do, um, let's just say, coding out of school, that definitely helps with maths. And in class, if the teacher asks a question, there'll be the people who put their hand up and then the other people who don't put their hands up because they know the answer, but they still have doubts and um, are worried that um, if they have doubts, that maybe if they get it wrong, what is the class gonna think about them? Is it, am I gonna, I don't know, lose a friend? That, that won't happen, but, or something like that, to the point that in some classes, the teacher, no one puts up their hand and the teacher has to choose random students in the class. Okay. Thank, thank you. And, and Driver, what do you think from a primary school perspective, from a year three student, what, what do you think about this competitiveness in the classroom? Well, I see a lot of kids that don't really do a lot of STEM and STEM subjects always um, in um, after in lunch lunch and recess. They're always actually the ones who um, do more of the clubs. For example, um, there's this boy in my class. He doesn't really put his hand up for any subject except for his, one subject, his favorite, except for art and. He, but, and then at, our, at lunches and recess, he does want to learn about the other subjects. It's just that um, he doesn't like doing 
um, the way that the other people do it. So he like always doing clubs about the other, su uh, other subjects. For example, there's um, he's in my coding club, and he's doing pretty well, but um, he doesn't like doing any subjects, but... But those. he likes coding. Yeah. That helps him. Fantastic. Thank you, Ryder. So, uh, unfortunately, this is pretty much all that we have time for today, so I would like to, A, try a summary, <laughs> and, and then thank the panel. So what we've heard, what we've heard today about is a very rational thinking about optimizing your ATAR and therefore not going into STEM subjects. We've also heard about um, the uh, competitiveness at school and how this competitiveness can sometimes then in inhibit participation because it, it, it has an impact then on the confidence. We, we also spoke about the measurement that's, and that maybe we're trying to overmeasure um, because we're trying to manage a finite number of of uh, seats that are available at the university. So we try, we're overmeasuring and with that we are instilling fear in the system that we have built, we the adults have built um, in, in measuring the students. We spoke about ways to maybe overcome some of the fears and to drive engagement. And um, we spoke about the practical application, that purpose, that things, STEM has to have purpose to make it interesting. We spoke about how this can be accomplished, for example, in exciting ways by sending experiments to the space station. We spoke about hands-on learning, um, uh, teacher education, and how we need to build the bridge between um, the industrial application and the examples that do very well exist out there in the world, and what the teachers know as examples so that they con can convey this uh, to their students. And I think that is all I can <laughs> really summarize at the moment. Hopefully that was okay. So I uh, would like to ask uh, you to um, uh, thank the panel. Thank you for your contribution. Well done. Good, and uh, that goes back to Chris. Come on.